uh, I'm going to have this discussion, um, although it will be didactic, meaning there's slides, and we'll address the slides. Try to be more on the level of the conversation I would have with you if you were my patients, some of you are my patients, uh, in, in how we communicate the information that's been provided you as we plan a surgical treatment. And um, I'm going to do it in the context of two patients. They're um, partly imaginary. They're, I'm going to say Bobby and Buddy. They're fraternal twins. Um, and both were made by their mother to go see the dermatologist recently. And Bobby has a melanoma in situ, that really thin one, on his leg. And Buddy has a 1.3 millimeter melanoma on his arm, a little, a little more serious. Now, they came in separately. Both of them married women named Betty. I know that because their mother, Barbara, came in with uh, Barney, her husband, and uh, um, I think uh, this family's probably from Arkansas, I'm not really sure. But they both had problems that, that, that reflect how we think through some of the science to plan surgical therapy. So um, the... Uh, Bobby has the in situ melanoma and is diagrammed here. It's a very thin thing, still in the epidermis of the skin. By definition, if that's all there is, it hasn't spread anywhere and it won't result uh, in a life-threatening condition. Buddy, on the other hand, has a little more serious melanoma uh, that uh, didn't have an ulcer, but nonetheless, it has spread below the, the junction between the dermis and epidermis. And so how we manage the two twins um, is going to be a little bit different, and I'll sort of explain how that happens. But the surgical decisions we make uh, are very much based on this pathology information that's been explained to you. That's the key thing at the initial point here where we it helps us decide to do a wide excision and how wide it should be. And when we decide about doing a wide excision, how are we going to repair it, sew it up, graft it um, one way or another? And it also provides us the information about doing a lymph node biopsy, why we do it and how we do it. So those are sort of the two ends of the spectrum here. Now, you've already seen slides on, on the staging, and this, this is a picture. I'm using this diagram of a, of a melanoma to just remind me and you that melanoma grows both horizontally outward in the skin. There are little tiny brown melanoma cells over here that are actually past where the visible edge of the melanoma is. So it has a horizontal growth. But the most dangerous part is this vertical growth, and that's measured by this depth of invasion, that millimeter number that comes with your biopsy. Because as the melanoma is getting deeper into the skin, it's getting down to these little these little green tubes are lymphatic channels, and then the blue tubes are veins. So it becomes a little more treacherous in its effect on patients, and that determines a lot of what our dis surgical decisions are. Be the only statistics I show you, but statistics, um, you know, at the outset, what happened to a thousand people with a certain condition doesn't really help you and me so much because whatever happens to my patient is black or white, it's what happens. But it does show us how we use those statistics. And rather than the, the uh, subcategories of staging, I'm just going to talk about localized disease, regional disease, distant disease, and an important group called unstaged. Now, these are data from what's called the SEER database, a, uh, a national registry of Medicare patients. But it's uh, one of the best publicly available data sets, and we can gather good information from it. If, in fact, the melanoma is truly localized, it's a 98% five-year survival. We talk in medicine about five-year survivals because that's, that's a way statisticians can give us information. Uh, you know, any one patient either does or doesn't have a five-year survival. If there is regional disease, and as Dr. Ryan pointed out, that means if it's gotten in the lymph glands or in the skin between the mole and the lymph glands, that survival goes down to about 62%. She presented the, the uh, statistics with distant disease, which it's not zero, and Dr. Cowie's going to talk about a lot of his strategies regarding that. But the key thing when we see patients, and one of the indications for sentinel lymph node biopsy, are the five-year survival for unstaged patients, even if they seem to have localized diseases, actually lower than 
if they do? Well, that's because in some patients we haven't proven they don't have positive lymph nodes. And so if you look at these two categories averaged together, it's going to be about this. So it is important to prognosticate correctly that we know the exact stage of disease. Hence, about 20 years ago, this concept of a sentinel lymph node biopsy came about so that we can actually accurately know whether there are even cells uh, of regional disease. So we have Bobby and Buddy, and both will need uh, what we might call a wide excision, which doesn't really explain how wide it is, and to a patient, how wide it goes can be a very important issue because that has to be repaired. But we talk about margins in this narrowest distance here is the margin of normal skin we're supposed to take around these. As Dr. Ryan pointed out, for Bobby, who had the in situ melanoma, it's only about five millimeters on either side. But you realize the width of what we remove is two times that margin plus the diameter of the mole we're taking. So a five millimeter margin can easily be a two and a half or three centimeter, almost an inch wide, um, width of, of an ellipse. Now this is shown as an ellipse, which means it's a lot longer than the, the diameter here. We do that because that, uh, that creates an easier and a more cosmetically appealing and functionally better repair. Um, by uh, lengthening the tissue removed and pulling it together, we distribute the tension on the wound over a larger area. It scars better, uh, there's less tightness, even though technically the skin scar is, is uh, longer. It's usually about two to three times as long as the width that we remove. Now that's Buddy, he, I'm, that's Bobby, Bobby had the melanoma in situ. Now Buddy, on the other hand, had a little deeper melanoma, it's 1.3. And our guidelines are how far around that we excise, which have been sorted out by numerous national and international studies. For the 1.3 millimeter melanoma will be this distance between one and two centimeters. And we say between one and two centimeters because how much we take does also depend on where it is on the body, how much we can take and, and properly repair things because an unrepaired wound is not a successful wound. So I'll generally use the rule, since I'm a simple person, if it's a 1.3 millimeter thick, and I know it's between one and two centimeters, I'll just say 1.3 centimeters. Uh, but we also have to work into the formula how we're going to repair it. Bobby had a melanoma on his thigh. Um, there's a lot of skin on the thigh. We can easily take five millimeter margins and close that. Buddy, on the other hand, has a little bit deeper melanoma, and it's on his forearm. And we don't have the luxury of removing all the skin we want on the forearm and trying to sew it up because it gets real tight and then the arm doesn't feel good. So these repairs sometimes have to consider skin grafts. <coughs> skin grafts to uh, replace the skin removed. You'll hear your surgeon talk about a couple different kinds. There's one called a split thickness skin graft and then there's one called a full thickness skin graft. The split thickness skin graft uh, just removes a partial layer of the skin such that we remove some skin that will grow, but we still leave skin elements that will regenerate so that we haven't created a deficit of skin. It does create a certain kind of wounding. A full thickness graft, on the other hand, takes all layers of the skin, and the skin won't regrow there, so we have to repair that one. So it come, it's sort of logical that if we take, we, if we need a large amount of skin, we use split thickness grafts. That's what's frequently used in burn patients because we can take a large amount of partial thickness. It'll repair itself and, and take it to the wound. A split thickness graft takes and grows sooner than a full thickness graft. It doesn't necessarily look as good and it takes it a lot longer to look like normal skin than the full thickness graft. So how we repair it depends on the location and how much we need to remove. In these cases, such on a forearm where we add, uh, say, one and a half centimeters on each side and a, and a two centimeter mass, we may have a four or five centimeter deficit. And this patient will probably, this is Buddy, will probably need to have a graft. So um, we talked about the primary closure, that's when we sew it up, the skin grafts, and then there are still occasions where we'll have our plastic surgeon colleagues 
uh, do what's called a flap. In other words, move patient's own tissue into the wound. We do have sort of rules and guidelines whether we use that, and we don't want uh, the repair to complicate these, the principle of removing the tissue. Now, one of the challenges of my part is explain about the lymphatics because nobody seems to understand that. And uh, uh, it's always a challenge. Trying to figure out how to explain this. Uh, um, I was working on my computer last night and the daughter to reboot the television so she could watch her TV show uh, crashed the uh, internet. So I had to track her down and ask her why she didn't at least tell me she was rebooting the whatever. She said, why did I bother you? And well, you killed my presentation. And so she really didn't kill my presentation, but I, I, I figured I'd try to explain to her what uh, the lymphatic system is. We have multiple circulation type systems in the body. Uh, and we all know there's the, the arteries that carry good blood from the heart and the veins that carry it back to the heart and lungs to be reoxygenated and pumped more. But separate from that is the lymphatic system, a, a very intricate group of, of, of channels that remove non-red blood cell things from the, from the body fluids. It may be dead germs, dead bacteria. It may be uh, certain kinds of dead white cells and other debris. Uh, it may be cancer cells that have been shed off by a tumor. And it gets into this system. It's kind of like, this is my daughter's explanation. So, you know, you have clean water under the, under the house. You have the not clean water that leaves your bathroom dad under the house. And then we have rainwater runoff. So you have all these systems under the house. The lymphatics is one that brings this fluid back. It travels distances, I'll get back to the nodes, and actually ends up being dumped into the venous system way up here where the body pressure is almost negative. So it, it sort of pulls the fluid up uh, by uh, both muscular contraction, pushing the fluid, some valves, and, and then the pressures. So that's what the lymph system is, and cancer cells can get in the lymph. The body, however, is well designed, and at certain interchanges or intersections along the way, there are a bunch of nodes or, or bumps, little masses of lymph tissue that's actually very complex, but it holds up this, these cells or the germs and so forth that have been uh, removed from the body fluids and taken to this point. A lot of things happen in the lymph nodes. Uh, but uh, relevant to our discussion or to a germ is an immunological response is initiated and the body starts working to fight those things. Just like lymph nodes get tender and swollen with infection, uh, they may become in, in, because the body is trying to fight against that and sometimes the germs beat the lymph nodes and they get very infected. Well, in cancer cases, the body is actually trying to kill off those cells. It doesn't win a lot of times when they get to the lymph nodes, but that's what's happening. And it's holding them in that, in that location. So when we're treating a patient with melanoma who has a condition that can go to lymph nodes, and we've seen from the statistics, it's real important to know if they have. <laughs> According to the guidelines that have been discussed, we will uh, do a certain kind of biopsy. Now, Bobby with the in situ melanoma is a melanoma by definition, never goes to the lymph gland system, and he doesn't need a, a, a sentinel lymph node biopsy. But Buddy's, whose was thicker, 1.3 uh, millimeters, has anywhere from a 15 to 30 percent chance of, of having cells in the lymph glands. So we'd like to know that. Now we use the term sentinel lymph node, just kind of like in the old cavalry got days, the guy who would sit on top of the forge, fort and watch to see if the bad guys are coming would first to see them and to do something about it. What happens on the day of the procedure, uh, this is all on the same day where the local excision occurs usually, the patient will start out going to the nuclear medicine department of the hospital where they have um, a weekly radioactive material called technetium sulfur colloid that's injected in the site around where the tumor is or was. And it's molecularly designed to be the right size and right consistency that it'll get in the lymph channels and it'll slowly, but not too slowly, migrate to the lymph nodes. Such that within about an hour, this weekly radioactive material can be seen on a scan and the radiologist can paint a picture of us exactly where 
uh, they injected and where the lymph nodes may be setting up so that we will know which lymph node to remove. We go to surgery and we have our own little handheld Geiger counter thing called a gamma probe, which uh, will allow us to pinpoint exactly uh, where that radioactivity is. We can make a small incision over it and remove that lymph gland or lymph glands and uh, have those analyzed. Now that can be done uh, in groin lymph nodes for a melanoma on the leg, uh, in the underarm, or we call it axilla for melanomas that are on the arm, or sometimes chest or back. And, and the cervical lymph nodes are the ones in the neck uh, for ones on the face, scalp, or some other location. So these fraternal twins, Bobby and Buddy, uh, their surgical treatment is going to be explained to them as Bobby, he will need a wide excision with five millimeter margins and what we call a primary closure, or we're going to close it up. He's not out of the woods yet. He's going to need close future follow-up with his dermatologist. And, uh, and I really try to emphasize at the beginning, even though Bobby's getting off easier than Buddy, Bobby still has an obligation to his health to follow up. You learned about the ABCDEs, the asymmetry of a mole, irregular borders, color change, diameter six millimeters or the size of a pencil eraser, and evolving or uh, enlarging. Uh, so I was working late last night. So we get to E, and I'm thinking, what's F? Find a dermatologist. G, go see the dermatologist. Those are two separate things in guy world. You know, your wife's been at you. You need to find a dermatologist. I've been talking to you. Your intern has told you to see a dermatologist. That was said to me. Um, yeah, I found a dermatologist. Have you gone to see him? No, you actually have to go see him. So that's fine, go, uh, have the exam, and invest your time and energy in getting the treatment completed. And I had a JKL, but I fell asleep. But that gets us in the right hands. So. Bobby still has some things he needs to do. Buddy has a 1.3 millimeter thick melanoma on his arm. He'll have a wide local excision defined by removal of about a centimeter and a half of normal skin on the narrow sides. He'll have the sentinel lymph node biopsy. And that really has to happen before we know that final stage to really prognosticate on uh, what uh, uh, his life expectancy could be, which is one thing, but more importantly, how we plan therapy and give Dr. Cowie the information he needs to uh, customize that. Um, he may have a negative node, that's good. We find out about a week later uh, what the uh, lymph node shows. Well, uh, Buddy will come in, we'll have that talk. If it's a negative lymph node, then he'll have close follow-up with his dermatologist, primary care, if that primary care does skin exams a surgical oncologist, and sometimes even these patients, if there are other high-risk features, may visit the medical oncologist. Now, uh, Dr. Ryan pointed out the importance of a complete skin exam, and, and part of my job as a surgical oncologist is make sure and making sure the patients who've had melanoma surgery get the complete exam. And I'm a simple person. I simply say, so you had a complete skin exam. Yeah, I had a complete skin exam. Guys will say that. I said. Did you take off your shoes and socks? Because that's like a big deal, because guys think their feet smell, and they sometimes don't want to do that. Because if you didn't take off your shoes and socks, you haven't had a complete skin exam. Did they uh, look where the sun don't shine? Uh, and uh, if the answer to that is uh, no, I frequently tell them, because if they didn't look where the sun don't shine, suit up, soldier, because we're fixing to do that. Uh, those are very important things, complete total body skin examination, and somebody needs to do it. There are primary care physicians who will do, do it, dermatologists always do it, and in our case, if nobody else has done it, we're going to do that. Important to me, my dad had an in situ melanoma found between his toes, and if his doctor hadn't done that, he wouldn't have known that. Now, if the note is positive, things get a little more involved, as has been pointed out, that patient Buddy will have to have further scans, more detailed evaluation of his uh, systemic disease status. I like a lot of times at this point to have them go ahead and visit with the medical oncologist so we begin to have a cohesive, coordinated care plan with all the experts. So Buddy will have some things he needs to do before we go to any further surgery if indicated. 
And then that brings us to a thing we call lymph node dissection, which is what we do at the next stage if there's enough suspicion of malignancy in lymph nodes, such as a positive sentinel lymph node, and there's no other evidence of disease, it may be appropriate to do a lymph node dissection. Now, that has a lot of different names in surgery, a radical neck dissection, a modified radical neck dissection, a selective <laughs> neck dissection. That's just describing what all is removed uh, in the neck area to get the lymph glands removed in, in, under the arm and axillary lymphadenectomy or in the groin, an ilioinguinal or groin dissection. There are other... Uh, smaller versions of that that your surgeon's supposed to know about, but that covers uh, the large majority. Some important things to know about uh, before having that. Before sentinel lymph node biopsy, 25 years ago, if patients had positive lymph glands, they all got this. And if it turns out they only had one positive lymph gland, then uh, uh, it may not have actually helped them or improved their survival. There was a point in time where we just did the lymph gland dissection based on the biopsy report alone. And if they had cancer in the nodes, that's good. That made them live longer. If there wasn't cancer in the nodes, it didn't help them at all. So now we have sentinel lymph node biopsy to guide us. The reason we don't want to just do the lymph gland dissection uh, without good reason, uh, there's a 20 to 40 percent incidence of long-term swelling called lymphedema. That's where the lymph lymph sort of backs up and has to find new pathways to get out of the region, whether it's the arm, the leg, or the, the head and neck. It is a treatable condition. Uh, here, here at Baylor, we have a lymphedema <laughs> clinic, and especially if we start working on this in the first uh, six months, it becomes very treatable and very manageable. There are, of course, other things uh, associated with it, local numbness, uh, and there's, uh, I use the term carefully, predisposition towards difficulty with infections of the involved part. Um, probably most commonly seen when women have had axillary lymph node dissection with breast cancer because that's a larger volume of people. Um, having the lymph nodes removed doesn't predispose them to infection, but it makes the treatment of any infection much more difficult because you don't have that flowing of the lymph fluid away from the wound to get all the bad things out. So patients have to be careful. So I've listed all these things. I'm not trying to frighten anyone from having a lymph node dissection because if, in fact, there's cancer there, it improves survival, and patients and their surgeons have to decide is the risk-benefit of that worthwhile. In most cases, when properly done, it is. So then my last slide. Um, uh, the twins, you know, their mother called, and she said, okay, i got to have some questions answered. The boys aren't here. I don't want to frighten you. Uh, frightened them, but uh, was this genetics, or was it hereditary, or was it just bad luck? Well, you heard some talks about genetics, and I think Dr. Cowrie will get into that more, but um, we talk about genes in the melanoma cells. Uh, a lot of times when my family talks about genetics, they're wondering about, well, did what Uncle Bert do affect little Billy Joe? Um, and uh, that's probably not genetics, but we do have hereditary issues. My son's had a melanoma in situ on his neck. My dad's had a melanoma in situ on his foot. Don't worry, they're both fine. But um, is that a genetic thing or is it hereditary? So, you know, about uh, when I was in college, I think I asked my dad, so dad, you know, our last name's a little funny, spelled funny, so where, does, where did our family come from? And he said, Oklahoma. And I said, <laughs> No, no, I mean, you know, really, you know, like Billy Joe came from Italy and, and, and Andrew came from West Africa. So where did our family come from? He said, Oklahoma, Norman specifically. <laughs> and I said, well, that, you know, so why is our name spelled P-R-E-S-K-I-T-T? -T? And he said, because we're from Oklahoma. <laughs> and so for the longest time, I just figured it was some unschooled Oki who couldn't really cipher well and was trying to spell P-R-E-S-C-O-T-T -T, and it just sounded right to spell it P-R-E-S-K-I-T-T. -T. But fortunately as my dad got older and wiser he got into genealogy and found that in fact the name does come from Scotland and Ireland. It actually did exist over there which kind of makes sense because we have the Scotch-Irish kind of skin which uh, is uh, what I'm getting to regarding heredity. Uh, and uh, that predisposes us to these kinds of burns and melanoma. 
So uh, in the case of the non-identical fraternal twins, it's probably the hereditary skin that's predisposed to that. We'll talk maybe at the uh, question and answer session about surgery for metastatic disease and other issues and uh, be able to deal with any further questions. Thank you.